Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsys with JT Longino. who's going to talk today about formal data path verification. So JT, what is formal data path verification? What defines that versus other kinds of verification? So when most people think about formal verification, they think about uh, the control path. They think about the, the pipelining and the state machine elements and all that different parts of, of your design. When we talk about the formal data path, now we're looking at leveraging formal solvers and formal methods to the data manipulation or data transformation areas of your designs rather than the control path areas. So why is this becoming a big problem now versus what it was in the past? Well, data path verification has historically been a hard thing in our industry. And there have been a number of well-publicized occurrences that incorrect uh, data manipulations have had significant financial or even physical uh, losses. With the rise of data path heavy IP, like in machine learning and artificial intelligence, the requirement to have high confidence in your data path designs above what you can get with simulation has become all the more important. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. What are we looking at here? So I mentioned before that simulation oftentimes is insufficient to get the kind of confidence we want in our data path designs. And this is an example of that. This is a two operand multiplier block, something that most people have had familiarity with or they've seen before. This multiplier block might take 16-bit operands, 32-bit operands, or 64-bit operands. Now, if we were going to try to prove this block exhaustively, what kind of time might we expect it to take? Well, let's go beyond anything we can get with our simulators, anything we can get with our emulators, and try to run it exhaustively on a commercial piece of, of processor silicon and say we can retire 3 billion operand pairs every second. Time is a major consideration here, right? Well, of course. If you have 16-bit operands, you have 2 to the 32 operand pairs, and if you can retire 3 billion operand pairs a second, this will take you about one and a half seconds. No problem. We're doing great. Now let's say we have 32-bit operands. This takes us to 2 to the 64 operand pairs, and at 3 billion op operation pairs a second, now it's going to take us roughly 195 compute years to go through all of these operand pairs. That is possible, maybe, if it's something that's really, really important, and we absolutely have to have it exhaustively correct, but it's unlikely that anyone's going to want to spend uh, to take that much verification resources towards one function. The way this has been done in the past is pretty much a brute force type of approach, right? What you're doing is adding a bit more intelligence in here. Well, the advantage of formal verification is that you can look across all of these operands without having to do it in an exhaustive brute force kind of way. So how do you do this in formal versus other types of verification? Yeah, so when we talk about formal verification, there are sort of two classes of tools that we look at. One is the property verification or model checking style of tool, which is historically what's been used for our control path verification. Another kind of formal tool that we look at is an equivalence checking tool, which its goal is to try to prove that two different representations of a design actually perform the same function. And it's this kind of equivalence checking tool that is particularly useful for data path problems. What are we looking at here? So this diagram shows uh, different kinds of things we might talk about when we talk about formal equivalence. Many verification engineers might be familiar with some kinds of equivalence, such as this combinational or logical equivalence here up on the top. In this case, you're looking at two different representations of a combinational logic cloud and making sure that the fan end to a particular flop is the same Boolean function even though they might be represented in different ways. This kind of equivalence check is very common, for example, in synthesis tools where your combinational logic may be manipulated to provide the 
best combination of power, timing, and area characteristics. This middle diagram shows a sequential uh, equivalence checking tool. Now the difference between a sequential checking tool and the combinational checking tool are now you're allowed to move some of your combinational elements across flop boundaries, which you typically can't do with these combinational equivalence tools. In this case, instead of looking at the output uh, of the Fanon cone for a flop, you'll look at the output after a sequence of flops and make sure that you're still getting the same behavior between the two representations of your design. Typically, in uh, the sequential tool, you'll see this used a lot for uh, X-propagation checking, for clock gating verification, uh, and for retiming when you might move elements of your design from one flop to another flop to improve, again, timing power or area. The final type of equivalence that we might talk about is a transactional sequential equivalence tool. And this kind of a tool now moves away from the requirement that your representations have to have similar latencies or uh, even have to be non-iterative. So with these kind of tools, you can have different latencies on your designs or no latency at all. And the advantage of not having any latency at all is now you've opened yourself up to the possibility of using general purpose software representations of your algorithm in something like C or C++. So each one of these still has a place, right? Uh, yes, of course. And they're, they're used in different areas of your design cycle. So your transactional equivalence tools might be used when you're wanting to look at equivalence between an abstract representation of your algorithm and a concrete RTL representation of your algorithm. Your sequential equivalence tool might be used when you're looking at uh, an optimized version of your RTL versus a more straightforward version of your RTL. And your combinational checking will be most frequently used uh, during the synthesis process to ensure that your synthesis tool hasn't modified the behavior of your design. So in the context of a, a formal data path, which one is the most relevant here? So for formal data path verification, the most relevant one is the transactional equivalence. Now it is worth noting that an equivalence check is not inherently a correctness check, but there are still advantages uh, and you can still get a lot of additional confidence in your design from an equivalence check. And there's a couple ways that you can get that confidence. The first reason is now you can compare your RTL to an abstract representation of your design, either in a hardware description language or in a general purpose software language like C or C++. So when you look at your, your golden model, you can use something that's not just developed in-house with maybe a handful of people, but now you can leverage code that's available open source or across the industry that's been vetted by a variety of programmers, mathematicians, and other hardware engineers. This is not a simple comparison. It's not like you're comparing two images. You're comparing complete data sets here, right? Yeah, so what you'll end up doing is verifying the equivalence of two different representations of a mathematical operation, even if sometimes the way that those representations go about performing that operation uh, can, be, can be quite different. For example, a plus sign in a C++ code uh, versus you know, some bit level adder that you might have in your RTL. So how does this work in the real world? So the first thing you want to do is find the function that you're interested in gaining confidence in. And a good place to start is to look at data path intensive blocks that implement mathematical primitives. Things like integer ALU operations, floating point operations, and DSP operations are all really good choices. The second thing you're going to want to find is a reference model. And you may already have one. It might be the reference model that you're using to do your simulation checks with. Once you have a reference model and the implementation that you're wanting to look at, you'll need to map the inputs and the outputs of those two representations of your design to make sure that uh, they're going to be doing the, the, the same thing. Some inputs you might be able to map directly, like this command input here. Other inputs might be represented in slightly different ways, like this data input that might represent two 32-bit operands going into your implementation. 
but they're split out into separate variables into your reference design. There may also be uh, inputs in either your RTL or your reference design that need to be tied off to some value or some range of values to perform the operation that you're interested in verifying. Likewise, for your outputs, you'll need to identify the, uh, the outputs and correct for any mapping differences between your two representations to uh, understand the, the things that you actually want to check. So putting this all together, how long does this actually take? Well, like any formal problem, it depends greatly on the complexity of what you're trying to verify and for equivalence verification tools, how close the implementation is between your uh, RTL and your reference design. There are some functions that can prove very quickly uh, from starting to set up to getting a, a full proof might be uh, a few days of an engineer's time and you know, 10 to 15 minutes of compute time to get the, the full proof. For complicated functions, uh, it, where the, the reference design and the RTL are very different, it might take several months of an engineer's time to get convergence on the design, uh, and the, the full proof might take, you know, several hundred compute hours to, to get to uh, convergence in the tool. This is still oftentimes quicker than uh, coming up with your coverage and closing your coverage were you to be in a simulation environment. JT Longino, thanks for a great explanation. Great, thank you.